Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, January 15th meeting of the Milford County Zoning Board. If we could uh, stand, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance and the Holy Spirit. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Um, good evening, I'm Brian Collegian. John Grant. Scott Marlowe. Tom Pansella. I'm Jim Quish. We have with us Meg and David from the city. Our uh, first order of business is uh, old business, 411 Lotus Point Road, petition of Joseph R. Cotus Body for Coastal Area Site Plan Review on Map 38, Block 533, Parcel 2A, of which Robert B. and Jenny Y. Finlayson are the owners. Continue from January 2nd. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, just for the record, my name is Thomas Lynch. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Lynch, Trimbicki, and Boynton. <coughs> my office is located here in Milford at 63 Cherry Street. And I'm here representing Robert Finlayson, Jr. I represented Mr. Finlayson uh, a couple of years ago when uh, this property was part of a two-lot subdivision uh, located on the end of uh, Welch's Point Road, right near the Captain Meadows School. <clears throat> the application that was brought before you uh, at the last meeting was a CAM review. Uh, it was a review of the uh, report that was prepared by Codex Bodian Associates. If you all recall, the matter was continued to tonight because there was some discrepancy on some dates on the plans and also some uh, clarification needed to be made at the post house meets the zoning regulations as it relates to the, how, the height of the house measured from the, uh, <coughs> the mean grade. So uh, revised architectural plans were submitted to the zoning office. I believe they were then forwarded to uh, all of you. Uh, Joseph Russo, who's an architect here in Milford, revised the plans to uh, bring the house to conformity with the zoning regulation. The plans that you have before you show a house that is 34.6 inches in height, which again does meet the zoning regulations. Uh, David submitted an administrative summary form this morning, as well as Steve Harris, uh, the zoning enforcement officer. Uh, both summaries again submitted to your file, verifying that the plan meets standards of the zoning regulations. I think it was previously noted that there would be no uh, infringement on the coastal area resources for this house. Uh, it's an elevated house that <coughs> is going to be built basically adjacent to the Cat 10 Marsh, but it has been engineered by Coast Lowy to meet all standards, and uh, the CAM report does speak for itself. So, since that was put over to this uh, meeting tonight, I'd ask that you vote and uh, approve it so my client can get forward with constructing this house. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Yes. Uh, the uh, the driveway. What's the material? I think it's going to be it's going to be asphalt. It's going to be gravel with asphalt on top of it. So it's not pervious? Uh No, it's it's going to be asphalt. It's going to be asphalt. So. Okay. 
a question for Dave because uh, was that figured in when uh, uh, you know if that was figured for the drop coverage as far as that driveway and so on to see if it meets the requirements? The very large lot, so I'm sure that it's not to meet very close to I will tell you it's, it's, it's a larger lot and drainage shouldn't be an issue because the city engineer is not what you think. Let's take a look. Just for the record, it is a 1.6 acre parcel of land. So, lot coverage is 8.5%. Any other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Solskis, do you have any comments? No, uh, other than uh, at the last meeting, uh, there was information that was uh, given to the board and the staff that night. Uh, we'd asked that uh, we review it. Uh, we've reviewed it and the plans to apply and we updated our reports. Yeah, and just for the record, I, I you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't mean to shut the applicant down. It was just that when you receive information at the last that minute, is, I just feel that it's important for the board to be able to spend a little bit of time on it to make sure they understand it fully. So I didn't mean to... Well, absolutely. And, and, and to follow up on that, it, it was discovered in discussing it with David afterwards that there was still amendments that needed to be made. There was a gap. Yes, there was. Right, so but that's all we take care of. Yeah, so... Um, I would uh, entertain a motion. Uh, I move to approve uh, the 411 Welch Park Road as presented. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. We have a second. Um, any further comment or question or discussion from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Seeing none, approve. Okay, so Um, so next on the agenda is 0 and 990 Naugatuck Avenue, petition of Jeffrey Gordon for a change of zone from HDD to WDD on that 40 block 330, lots 2 and 3B, of which Recycling Inc. is the owner. Hi. Hi. Uh, for the record, uh, Franklin Tulsi, uh, 365 Main Street, Watertown, Connecticut. I'm a land use attorney in Connecticut. I'm speaking on behalf of the applicant. I have prepared a written memorandum as well as I can pass out. This memo is presented to be included in the record with respect to both applications. It's intended to address uh, many of the issues that were discussed at the last uh, public hearing session and specifically to comment on some of the legal aspects of the application. But firstly, uh, the introduction just restates that the applications are for a zone change of 0 plus 990 Nagata Avenue on the Sutonic Design District to the uh, WPD Waterfront Design District, and then to reference the zoning regulations text change that have been uh, submitted. As stated previously, the applicant is Primrose Companies, uh, Recycling Inc., and Coruscant. The property description is referenced here again <coughs> at 990 Nogatuck Avenue. It's been known as the recycling uh, property. It's adjacent to the Housatonic River and has been used as a recycling business and similar uses. The property has a deserved reputation for significant environmental pollution and excessive truck traffic. Such concerns have resulted in neighborhood opposition 
to ongoing efforts to increase and intensify the recycling use. The city of Milford itself has been involved in continuous litigation for more than 10 years concerning this property. The litigation includes zoning matters, environmental matters, environmental appeals, environmental enforcement proceedings, tax collection cases, <coughs> and ownership of license issues. This litigation has been ongoing and is likely to continue until a permanent solution comes forward. <coughs> Caswell Cove is the condominium property adjacent to recycling. Caswell is located in the WDD zone. Caswell consists of 204 condominium units. Caswell was originally approved for 280 units, approximately. Remaining <coughs> authorized units have not, not been built due to poor economic conditions historically. More recently, a number of developers have been interested in completing the additional units. However, the undeveloped portion of Caswell property, approximately five plus acres, is immediately adjacent to the recycling. This proximity to recycling has discouraged a number of genuine opportunities to complete as well during the last 10 years. Primrose has entered into an agreement to develop 44 condominium units on the Caswell property as part of the overall development plan. The Caswell unit owners are in support of the Primrose applications. Solving the recycling property issues also means Caswell can finally move forward. It is noted that Caswell is reducing the original approval of approximately 280 units to the 204 units completed and the 44 units that are proposed out of the remaining 76. Present conditions have essentially zoned Caswell out of opportunities to complete the additional units. It's noted at the last public hearing session a protest petition was filed pursuant to General Statute Section 8-3B. Devon filed a statutory protest petition claiming to own 20% or more of the lots within 500 feet in all directions of the property included in the proposed change. The protest petition again was filed pursuant to this statute and the statute tells us that if you meet the 20% land area requirement then the voting requirement by the commission changes to two-thirds of all members of the commission. Uh, Jeff Gordon and Codus Body Associates have attempted to measure and determine whether or not the Devon property in fact consists of 20% of the total area needed for a valid protest petition. The calculation that I have received shows that it does not. That it's very close, but it does not. So the Devon protest petition may or may not qualify under the statute. They would need to produce a quantifiable area mapping that would demonstrate ownership of the 20%. And ultimately, zoning staff will have to review the issue and determine if the protest petition uh, is valid. The next point <coughs> Primrose would like to make is as you know, the zoning agency has the broadest possible discretion that may be exercised when entertaining an application to change the zone or to change the text uh, of the, your regulations. And I cited a quote out of Fuller on land use law of practice that basically states that you're acting in legislative capacity when passing on a zone change or fixes zone boundary boundaries a zoning commission, it's sometimes called a legislative capacity. And the citation that is most often used for this statement comes from a superior court case that involves this commission, uh, Malafronti. And it's a 1967 case that goes back many, many years, but remains pertinent today. And Malafronti, this commission changed the zoning regulations to promote a housing development. There was opposition. Appeals were filed. The Connecticut Supreme Court upheld the commission decision. The 
court ruled that zoning must be sufficiently flexible to meet the demands of increased population and evolutionary changes such as architecture, transportation, and redevelopment. The zone change was found consistent with the comprehensive plan and with a predominating purpose to benefit the community as a whole. The court found that the commission decision properly took into account consideration of existing uses in the neighborhood, the needs and growth of the city, future desire or so I'm sorry the desire to provide for the best interest of the entire community in the foreseeable future. And again, the commission has the broadest possible legislative discretion in deciding this application. The statute tells us that in the next section Primrose discusses its opinion and its reading of the plan of conservation and development. A zone change application must be found consistent with the plan of development. A plan of development is not based on existing conditions, but is rather a blueprint for recommended future development. I repeated the statute here of 8-23 and <coughs> highlighted the pertinence of this enabling statute, so to speak, that are pertinent in drafting the plan of development. And then I go on to cite that the Milford Plan follows the statutory criteria. And again, going back to the statutory criteria, much of it does relate to housing. And in fact, much of your plan that we're talking about tonight is dominated by discussions about housing. And I'll refer to several areas of your plan that talk about this type of housing, as well as housing generally. At page 12, to promote housing choice and economic diversity in housing, including housing for both low and moderate income households, and encourage the development of housing which will meet the housing needs identified to the housing plan prepared to section 8-37T, which is the state plan, and in, in, in the housing component and the other components of the state plan of conservation and development. Section 8-37T is a statute providing for a state long-range housing plan and related annual action. The Milford Plan, beginning at page 137, states that the Milford Plan is consistent with the state statute. In preparing the plan, the Commission shall consider development and revitalization, revitalization in areas with existing or planned physical infrastructure. Moving to page 13 of your plan, it states, Today, Mil Milford's vacant, <coughs> undeveloped land resources are limited. There are few vacant parcels to identify for pre preservation and even fewer parcels to target for brand new development. At page 16, there's some background information with respect to the multifamily use that's being proposed in these applications. And it states the number of parcels total in Milford at 19,385 and the number of parcels in a multi-family zone of 529. The total acres available for multi-family is 158 compared to the total acres of the town of 11,589. The percentage of land area in this category is 1.37%. Page 19, it talks about future land use trends. With vacant residentially zoned land availability at a minimum, there will be increased pressure for infill development and more intensive development on developed properties with less development constraints. With limited, limited area left for traditional single family home development, <coughs> the only available areas for expansion without changing zoning will be in the corridor zones that allow for residential development under specific conditions and within Milford Center. Housing on page 61. At one of the, as one of the principal land uses in the community, housing and housing related issues affect all residents. Connecticut General Statutes, section 8-23, which sets standards 
for municipal plans and states that such plans shall take into consideration the need for development of housing opportunities for affordable and multifamily housing, housing that is pedestrian-oriented housing, housing in mixed-use settings, housing that is transit accessible. As shown on the attached map, residential development comprises a majority of the city's land area. At page 65, this, when combined with the development that has taken place since the last plan, as well as major open space acquisitions, results in a remaining 142 acres residentially zoned. At page 65, it notes, it is interesting to note that dramatic population growth has not occurred as a result of the increase in the number of dwelling units in Milford. In fact, Milford's population has continued to hover in the 50,000 person range over the last several census counts, with only an 11,000 person increase over the last 50 years. At page 66, there's a comment on affordability, housing affordability. It states, there continues to be much discussion concerning the issue of housing affordability in Milford. When one discusses affordability, it is important to clearly identify the parameters of affordability. One definition of affordability is that included under 8-30G of the statutes, wherein certain units are counted as affordable for purposes of determining a community's exemption from the Affordable Appeals Program. Under that program, at least 10% of the community's housing stock must be affordable. Such units include those receiving government assistance for construction or rehabilitation, housing occupied by persons receiving rental assistance, homes financed by CHFA or Fireman's Home Administration mortgages, or deed restricted properties. In the most recent 2011 computation, Milford's percentage of affordable housing is at 1,404 units, or 6.08% which is up from 5.8% 10 years earlier. At page 69, the plan states, however, specific actions which permit higher density residential development or the provision of bonuses to projects which include affordable housing, support accessory apartments, and or encourage higher density, mixed uses, commercial residential projects in specific section of Milford may create an increase in the variety and affordability of housing in Milford. At page 69, it talks about future housing projects. Due to the lack of developable land, there will be increased pressure for infill development and more intensive development on developed properties with less development constraints. With limited land use, for single family homes. The only available areas for expansion, again without changing zoning, will be in the corridor zones that allow for residential development under specific conditions and within Milford Center. Both areas have easy access to mass transit, shopping, and other services. Development of higher density housing will require greater architectural standards, greater pedestrian and bicycle friendly infrastructure. Site development that is both green and provides real outdoor amenities, usable, accessible green roofs, and we're located within walking distance to the transportation. The Planet 137 contains a statement of consistency, again, uh, with the state plan and the regional plan of conservation and development. And some of the priorities cited is a goal to expand housing opportunities and design choices to accommodate a variety of household types and needs. Also to conserve and restore the natural environment. At page 138, there are some growth management principles stated. 1.5 is to remediate, redevelop, and reuse brownfields and significant vacant or underutilized facilities that are in strategic location. And the comment here is, yes, Milford supports that, or the plan supports that, uh, for 
private property owners as well as perhaps the municipality owning land. At page 139, the growth management principle continues and it talks about to enhance housing mobility and choices across income levels and promote mixed income developments through both ownership and rental opportunities. And the comment and the plan is that zoning specifically calls zones preferred affordable housing development and mixed use development. Again, a statement that Milford and your plan support this type of development. 2.5, support local efforts to develop appropriate urban infill housing and neighborhood amenities to make better use of limited urban land. And again, there's a comment that the Milford Plan supports uh, that principle. I'm sorry. I don't want to truncate your presentation, but I don't see how any of this has anything to do with the, what's in front of us. Well, I think that what Primrose or any applicant for zone change must demonstrate that there's, there's support for it in the plan of development. And what we did is we took out the sections of the plan of development that we think support this type of an application. Okay. Have at it. Thank you. The other section of the plan that I want to comment on is page 114 of the utilities. This section of the plan notes that more heavily industrial and manufacturing uses that require truck traffic have moved to areas with better highway access. Uh, so your plan calls for some of these uses that might use a recycling site someday to be moved to a different area towards the highway. Milford has also supported this goal with an ordinance to restrict truck traffic from na neighboring portions of Naugatuck Avenue from West Avenue to Big Drive. The next issue Primrose wants to comment on is the uniformity issue that was mentioned at the end of the last public hearing. <coughs> the applicant has proposed density standards for the subject parcel greater than the existing density in the existing WDD zone. Specifically, the applicant proposes that the higher density standard apply only to parcels that are being rezoned from industrial to the uh, WDD zone. So the applicant is not suggesting that all existing WDD zone, zone property would be part of this new regulation. It has been argued that this different density standard applicable for property change from HDD would only apply, would, would violate the uniformity requirement of Section 8-2. The uniformity argument is that a zoning agency may not adopt a regulation that gives itself the authority to vary the objective standards of the regulations on a case-by-case -case basis. Such zoning is sometimes called case-by-case -case zoning. Although many zoning agencies have adopted such regulations, the uniformity issue has recently been the subject of a number of court decisions. This issue first came into great focus with a recent appellate court case called McKenzie. In that case, the regulation provided a standard for a buffer and a landscape buffer. The commission believed it had the authority to waive or vary that regulation, and in fact did so. And the appellate court ruled that the regulation that allows a commission to vary or waive an objective standard violates the uniformity uh, goal or the uniformity requirements of Section 8-2. The present application, unlike McKenzie, is not seeking his own regulation that can be varied on a case-by-case -case basis. This application is seeking a separate density subsection that would apply uniformly to all properties zoned WDT that were formerly in an industrial zone. This type of regulation is not uncommon in situations where former manufacturing or industrial buildings <coughs> have needed such new and flexible regulations to allow commercial or residential uses in such buildings when redevelopment occurs. Similarly, in some commercial zones, there are regulations that allow for different lot sizes based upon a special permit. Again, there's no 
violation, in our opinion, of the so-called uniformity rule with the proposed tax change. The next section I'm going to comment on is the affordable housing statute. This is not an affordable housing application. But it seems every time a significant housing application is filed, the affordable statute, the affordable housing statute, somehow gets into the discussion. And again, we cite the provisions of the statute and that the affordable housing uh, does not have to, uh, may not be located or at least be subject to the appeal program if it's located in a residential zone unless the residential zone already allows a residential use. The case was cited at the last public hearing session that stated because hotels are allowed in your regulations that that alone does not take the industrial use and bring it within the so-called some residential use. Primrose believes that the Baker case does not apply because in the Baker case, the case was largely decided based upon the definition of the residential use in the regulations of that town. And the residential definition specifically excluded hotels. There are a number of court cases that have supported the statutory affordable housing applications where some residential use is allowed. The one criminal cited here is the appellate court case where convalescent home use was deemed a residential use. In the Milford regulations, there's no definition of the residential use or the hotel use or the extended stay hotel use. But the, it's interesting that the extended stay <coughs> hotel use requires or mandates that each unit have a separate kitchen. It's also noted that the Milford Housing Authority has on various occasions relocated tenants into area hotels for extended stays. So again, this is not an affordable housing statute, but because it was brought up, we're submitting these comments to the record. The DPE, DEEP referral comments, I'd like to comment briefly here. The DEP, the EP comments, tell us a couple of things if you read. And one is, the main theme of the report is to focus on the stated purpose of preamble to your existing WPD zone. And I don't have to repeat that, it is stated in the report. But the report then goes on to talk about what the real intent of the report is. And that is to tell us if the proposed use is a water dependent uh, development and it significantly finds that the proposed use is a water dependent uh, proposal. The recommendation in the report is that the applicant withdraw and come back with a different zoning approach. Again, presumably to avoid a potential adverse impact on an existing zone. It is significant that the report in two places acknowledges that rezoning and higher density is necessary to redevelop this contaminated property. It quotes, it is understandable that financial incentives, particularly, particularly in the form of higher density development than would otherwise be permitted, may be necessary to redevelop parcels that are historically contaminated. It states, we understand that a creative solution which could potentially include some type of regulation change may be necessary to promote cleanup and reuse of the subject property. I'm going to move to is a comment that we put in about spot zoning because we believe this was mentioned at least briefly. And that spot zoning requires a two part test. The first is that the zone change concerns a relatively small area of land. And the second, and the only significant one in recent cases, is whether or not the proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan. And fuller land use 
law and practice states the proper focus with respect to a zone change application as the plan of conservation and development. Uh, and so, so that is the primary focus that we believe is appropriate. A state in conclusion that throughout zoning, throughout Connecticut, zoning agencies are recognizing the need to change regulations to accommodate change conditions and specifically contaminated sites. Many of the otherwise most desirable locations for development are burdened with long-standing <coughs> contaminated properties, sometimes called brownfields. Such properties often remain dominant for decades, seeking a private development with deep pockets or more likely public remediation <coughs> funding, which remains scarce. This application, in conclusion, including the presentation, we believe is unique in many ways. The first is recycling property is unique in a bad way. There's significant environmental contamination. The owner has sought for many years regulatory approval to greatly expand the recycling use, which means more trucks, the perception or the reality of more contamination, and no environmental remediation. Again, this litigation has been ongoing for 10 years. Milford has been a large part of that, and to a lesser extent, Caswell as well. The application is unique also in the sense that it provides an opportunity to remediate a known environmental concern. It provides an opportunity to end the recycling type uses of this property and to mitigate the neighborhood concerns with respect to both environmental issues and the heavy, the, uh, heavy trucking issues. It's also unique for another reason, and that is this applicant, Primrose Companies, which is John Gitz. John knows that this is a multi-year redevelopment project. He knows that it's extremely costly, but John has experience with this type of development. He has experience with working with the rail entities for the crossings. He understands fully what he is seeking to accomplish here, and that it's going to be extremely costly and extremely time consuming. There's a number of choices to deal with this issue. Uh, Primrose and Caswell believes that the best choice is to approve the applications. Now, where do we go from here? If the commission agrees, and the commission uh, sees its way to approve the applications, then that means the zoning issues are pretty much settled, but it's really the beginning of a much longer process. Mr. Getz will then have to develop some overall development plans, but he'll need regulatory approval from many other agencies. And probably the toughest and longest will be the railroad uh, companies that have to uh, approve any such crossing that would be needed for this property. So all the reasons that we stated, we believe that this application does conform with the express stated goals for the plan of development, and we believe that it's an important opportunity to clean up a property that has been a burden to many for a long time. Any questions? I'll try to answer them, but maybe Jeff is going to talk. Or... <coughs> uh, Mr. Lucas, any questions or, or comments you'd like to make? Um, I'll just say something just briefly. Um, uh, Mr. Colossi uh, mentioned a lot of uh, general language from the plan of conservation development that I have. Been, uh, <coughs> When you got specific about certain locations in the plan of conservation development, uh, and it's spelled out um, specifically on page 19, on page 69, uh, the development talks about corridor districts. This isn't the corridor district. That's awesome. I just comment briefly that our, what we're urging the commission to consider is that the overall goal of the plan is to develop different and mixed opportunities for housing. And that it tells us in several places that that's probably going to need a zone change. And 
and the conclusory statements of principles and compliance with these principles, I believe it's acknowledged that zone changes will be needed to meet these housing goals. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the board of this? The applicant still has the floor. Yes. My name is Jeffrey Gordon. I'm president of the Post Story and Associates. I'm an environmental planner and landscape architect um, doing business in Orange, Connecticut. Um, I'm just going to hit some of the uh, specifics uh, based on Attorney Colsey's comments. Um, just to address a little bit, uh, first of all, about the area. The assertion of 20% is very, very uh, challenging to quantify without a survey. Uh, what I did is we have a survey of the property where we're looking for the zone change, then we have to work with the GIS of the town, the town's maps, uh, to do the 500 foot radius, and then to quantify the land that Devon Power owns, and the double cross hatch on the bottom. Being really generous, I can get to like 20.2%. Other calculations have me at 19.5, 19.6%. They need to have something a little bit more specific because 20% is 20% is 20%. It's not 19.9 or 20.1, but if they're gonna make the assertion, they would really need to demonstrate and work the staff on that. Uh, just again, uh, a couple of other comments regarding to Devon uh, Power. Uh, again, we made the uh, comment about uh, being a good neighbor also means having sets of eyes on you. Uh, as you're probably aware, uh, the Devon power plant was not always a good neighbor. It was once considered uh, part of the Sooty Six, uh, one of the uh, higher polluting plants uh, in the region. Uh, but by a watchdog agency, they were forced to become a good neighbor. They uh, wound up uh, switching to a gas fire turbine system. Uh, based on their literature, uh, it appears that they're a peak uh, production plant that when the demands are up to, to make it up as well. Uh, there was also comments about the chimney stacks. Uh, I'll just give you a few of these. The stacks Compared to our property, where our building would be, are either a quarter of a mile away or 0.42 miles away. Uh, the, actually, the radius to the residential areas off of Naugat Tuck Avenue or reaching to I-95 are uh, closer than we would be. Uh, and uh, the second page, you kind of get a, a glimpse. This is taking a photo from uh, roughly where our buildings would be. And uh, this is the gas-fired uh, stacks. This is the old uh, coal-fired stacks. Having a set of eyes on them is a good thing. Um, NRG, which also owns a Montville power plant, uh, did try to uh, change from a, uh, an oil and gas fired plant and go in for a gasified coal plant. But again, the watchdog agencies and the pressure got them to withdraw that. So having a set of eyes can keep a good neighbor to maintain being a good neighbor. So uh, we don't have an objection with that. There are power plants. Uh, even urban areas right next to housing, you can drive down the FDR Drive in New York and everybody's right next to each other. It does require them to be clean, and we think that's good. We think that's good not just for the immediate joiners, but for all people in the city of Frankfurt. Uh, one other comment that was made. was that uh, the access to the site uh, only had an eight foot wide easement. Uh, that's not really the case. Uh, here is one easement, and then there's a stacked easement on top of that also, as shown here, which gives us uh, access easement about 40 feet wide. So there is a little bit of a difference between eight and 40 feet. In fact, recycling <coughs> provides an easement across their property to get into their own power. So, they have an easement across my client's property, and my client has 40 foot uh, access uh, easement to get in. The uh, comments in the plan of conservation development about supporting the utility corridor doesn't really say how, 
perhaps maintaining its status as a clean operator is a way to support it. Uh, perhaps uh, encouraging them to run it more efficiently more often would be a way to support it. Um, and preventing them from reverting back to coal or coal gasified plant with the uh, proposed reduced mercury emissions that EPA is now putting out there, we run the risk of having more mercury uh, if those standards get lower. So again, the watchdog access is, is pretty good. Um, Attorney Pelosi noted the shifting of industrial development to the I-95 corridor, uh, encouraging higher intense traffic generators to continue along the I-95 corridor. The city of Milford included, it added an ordinance uh, in chapter 14, and it says, um, they, they added an ordinance, and I have some uh, photos of that, of um, preventing the traffic on that section of Houstonic, uh, Naugatuck uh, Avenue. Question would be if your if your plan of conservation and development says that the heavier type of traffic should be moving closer to uh, Woodmont Road and I-95, and then you're passing an ordinance prohibiting commercial traffic in the area, it would seem counterintuitive to then increase the industrial use or maintain industrial use when you have opportunity uh, to do otherwise. The, uh, thought about a substantive due process. Uh, government regulations must be reasonably related to permissible purpose of government, and the government decisions must be made in the furtherance of those reasonable objectives. So if you're saying reduce the traffic, well, then you should be making decisions that reduce that kind of heavy truck traffic. The current zone, the uh, Housatonic Design District, permits heights of 120 feet, permits the hotels, extended state hotels, it permits a side yard uh, setback of 20 feet. The current zone permits all uses in the district. The proposed waterfront design district would make all uses special permit. As amended, it would restrict the height to 60 feet, which is half of what the Housatonic design district allows, 120 feet. Uh, it would require setbacks equal to the building height or minimum of 30 feet. Uh, existing waterfront design district properties could not be expanded without the acquisition and removal of existing privately owned units. The waterfront design district limits site building coverage 20% of the site. Most existing waterfront property, design district properties lie in flood zones requiring new construction to be elevated. The existing waterfront design district properties on East Broadway, Viscount Drive are all in flood zones. properties on East Broadway, including Heritage Sound, are non-conforming. The waterfront design district designation was applied on these after they were developed. Some of these buildings in the district are already four and six stories tall. The amendments would make these properties more conforming. Did the city, in putting the waterfront design district over these developments, some with height and setback non-conformity to the zone, they did create a uniformity issue saying, well, it's all right for these things to exist here, but the other areas of town, you got to be 35 feet tall. Um, again, as far as being located next to a power plant, people who purchase along the waterfront are aware of waterfront activities. These may be fishing uses, recreational uses, and older industrial uses. The designers mitigate this with building orientation, berms, landscaping, crafting desirable view corridors, in many other areas, residential uses coexist with power facilities and have for years. Unfortunately, newer technologies have made the relationships more acceptable. Uh, waiting for a better user will only consign the site to further degradation, inactivity, and nuisance. I drive by uh, a site in Orange. I've been driving by there for uh, 30 some odd years. They had a mall. Uh, $100 million mall with Bloomingdale's, Lord & Taylor, I'm not going to go there. They waited that out. They had Stu Leonard's. They had 
incredible universe. They kept on waiting for something, and now they are going to wind up with a truck terminal. So sometimes windows of opportunity open, and sometimes they close. Uh, you may not get a truck terminal on this site, as it is prohibited in the Houston County Design District, one of the few uses that are. But this is a fine opportunity for a private investor to make an underproducing property an asset. Unless the city wants to pour millions into the property to acquire, clean up, and make it a park, uh, this is really what you want private enterprise to do. Thank you. Any uh, comments on this? Any comments on comments or questions from the board? Okay, this is a public hearing, so if anyone would like to speak, please come up to the podium. Uh, please. State your name and address for the board. We don't need to do that. No, please state your name and address for the board. And uh, please. Hello, again. I'm Daddy Bateman, 632 Folks Island Road, Edgewell Cove. I'm entering my fourth position as president. My fourth year, I'm sorry. And uh, I, I can't believe we ha we're having this issue. I really can't. First of all, I can't believe that Caswell Cove was ever allowed to build with one in and out road. If you've ever been there, about 20 years ago, an elderly woman had an issue. She had a mental breakdown. She was living there with her son and his wife. <clears throat> and when I got home from work, there were fire trucks, ambulances, and police cars everywhere. I could not get to my unit. And I'm sitting there with everybody else, maybe about 100 people, all no one knew what was really going on. And to make a long story short, it dawned on all of us at the same time. If there were a fire or a problem down at the other end of the cove, where we live, our area there, nobody could get in or out. I don't know how that happened in the first place, but I'm not going to complain about it. But that's one of the real uh, issues that I'm hoping we can get over by having this developed. I mean, this, this goes a long way with us. First of all, we have the property there. We can use that, that area there for financial reasons, obviously, plus to add to the $6 million plus in taxes that we're already paying. And mm -hmm. you're not getting a dime out of 990. I realize that's not the issue here, but it's something to think about. And I just really hope that you will give this some really serious consideration because it means a lot to over 500 people in those 40 acres. So thank you for your time, and I hope you're with us. And thank you for all our friends that are here fighting for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So the first thing I want to address is um, the assertions by my colleagues that we do not meet the requirements for a petition under Section 83B. And I would note that um, uh, Mr. Gordon is not a licensed surveyor, at least he didn't represent that he was one. What I would like to hand in today is a map that was done by a licensed surveyor. I don't have a ton of them, but. Uh, specifically, um, Brian Mitchell, who is the Director of Survey for AEI Consultants. As you can see at the top of that plan, uh, the area was calculated pursuant to uh, surveys by this licensed surveyor. The total land area within the 500 foot footprint was 1,173,485 square feet. The Devon property was 413,461 square feet which gives you a total of 1,586,919 square feet. And when you do the calculations, dividing one into the other, it comes out to 26%. So I do encourage you to go ahead and, and double check those numbers, but again, that's by a licensed surveyor. So our position is that we do meet the, uh, the requirements. Um, I wanted to address only just briefly the discussions by Mr. Pelosi regarding the Baker case that I cited to all of you the last time you were here, dealing with um, whether the industrial exemption applies in an affordable housing application context. You have to understand the reason that was raised is because they submitted to you official, uh, a fiscal impact analysis suggesting to you that but for this, the only thing that could go there would be affordable housing. And I just want to reiterate that while the Baker case is not an appellate court case, it is completely on all fours. And I take issue with Mr. Pelosi's assertion that it's distinguishable from the facts of this case. It was an industrial zone that allowed for transitional uses just like your industrial zone. They conceded it's an industrial zone. It was an industrial zone that allowed for hotels. And it was an industrial zone that specifically prohibited residential uses, just like your HDD zone. <coughs> so what I can say to you is, based on that analysis, it <coughs> suggests to me the industrial exemption would apply as long as it remains the HDD zone. But I think the most important thing to realize is that if you change the zone to WDD, that's when the Affordable Housing Act unequivocally would apply the industrial exemption would no longer be applicable because it would no longer be an industrial zone. Um, I also wanted to just address the disparaging remarks made about my client. Um, again, suggesting that Devon <coughs> is not a good neighbor at this juncture. I think every power facility throughout the state has gone through growing pains over the last you know, 40 or 50 years. Uh, NRG and all other energy plants are no different than any other. Uh, the Montville plant that he referred to was formerly a coal plant. They were looking to convert it to a wood chip plant. Uh, again, it has no bearing uh, on the plant here that's operating here pursuant to current federal and state laws. It's completely in compliance. I would also say that if the notion of this being changed to a WD zone and having a very intensive multifamily residential use was of no concern to Devon, I would not be here. They have no objection to the property being developed, and they are not advocating for the recycling facility to be reopened. But what they are advocating for is that the zone remain an HDD zone, and that, just like the DEP recommended, that the owner of the property or a potential developer work with the city to come up with an appropriate transitional use that will preserve the utility corridor there as your plan of conservation and development called for, potentially providing public asset access to the waterfront, which both your plan of conservation and development and the DEP think is pretty critical, and meet the objectives of the Caswell Cove condominium in that some type of a more uh, 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 acceptable development would transition between the condominiums and the existing power plant. 
There was a lot of talk tonight about truck traffic. The plant is there. The truck traffic to the plant is going to remain the same. Um, they're not going anywhere unless, of course, uh, they have to truncate their operations based on uh, the zone change. So I don't understand all of the talk about truck traffic, uh, but what I can say is, again, um, if the concern here is traffic, having a very high intensity residential use is not going to support limiting the amount of traffic on that street. Um, other less intense, light industrial or transitional uses, you, you allow for marinas. You know, there would be no truck traffic, there would be very little uh, automobile traffic at all from a use like that. And it would provide public access to the waterfront. Um, <coughs> I think it was also significant that both your city planner and the DEP recognized the disparate impact of this proposed zone change uh, to the WDD zone. They've made a lot of talk about it not violating the uniformity standards or <coughs> not constituting spot zoning. But if you read Mr. Pillacy's remarks, you'll see he even suggests that if you object to it, you call it a WDD1 zone. If that isn't spot zoning, where you're creating zone just by this one little parcel of property, I don't know what is. And so again, you know, it's not just me. DEP agrees, your, your city planner agrees. Um, let's see. I think I would echo what your city planner said, that Mr. Pelosi, took great pains to pull out snippets of the plan of conservation <coughs> development relating to the overarching goal of applying for uh, uh, a mix of housing opportunities. I think every community, that's, a, that's an objective. But you can't look at those snippets without looking at the rest of the plan of conservation and development and the objective of preserving your industrial zone as well as this particular utility corridor. So you can't take one without the other. Sorry for the hesitation. I just only got Mr. Pelosi's comments tonight. Um, the other thing I would mention that's in his uh, comments, when, it, when he talks about uh, uniformity, he talks about the McKenzie case. I just want to be clear. The McKenzie, like, McKenzie case is totally an opposite from the fact here. In that case, the, the zoning regulations at issue allowed the commission at its discretion to waive certain provisions under the zoning regulations. It had nothing to do with its own change. Um, so it's completely an opposite, and, um, and it should not, therefore, uh, affect your decision. OK, I think um, then in conclusion, what I would want to say again is, Devon's not opposed to any development here, but they are very, very concerned about an intense residential development that close, which actually could thwart, now they talk a lot about the distance of the stacks <coughs> currently from where they're proposing to put a residential use, but they're forgetting the fact that, you know, Devon needs to have the ability to change and grow and expand and to meet the ever-changing uh, technological landscape. And their concern uh, with a high intensity residential use, is that that will work whatever may come in the future when it comes to the development and growth uh, of the Devon plant. And because there are more appropriate uses, and again, even the DEP agrees, because there are more appropriate transitional uses, Devon asks that you would heed the DEP's advice, that you encourage the withdrawal of the application, and that the owner and the developer of the property or any potential developer work with the city to come up with something that better meets the objectives of your plan of conservation and development while preserving the industrial properties and the uh, utility corridors that currently exist. Thank you. Thank you.
there anyone else who would like to speak? Good evening. My name is Nancy Citarella, and I, work, I live at 1236 Windward Road at Castle Hill Condominiums. And I'd like to kind of rebut a lot of things that we just said. Uh, we are all ready to and we're happy there if we are a resident of the community. And we would very much like to expand our community onto the land that we uh, have owned uh, to get more neighbors to help in our community, to help um, reduce some of our costs and increase our property value. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Puba. I live at 514 Pope's Island Road. I'm in favor of the zone change, and uh, I'm a little confused about why Devon Power is so against this. And my thoughts are, two years from now, we're going to be sitting in the same room <coughs> with them wanting to buy that piece of property to move that power plant bigger and closer to our condominiums. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's no reason why they would be fighting this so much. It's all about them wanting to save that piece of property for them to buy, and that's my personal opinion, and mark my word, we will be back in this room with them wanting to buy that piece of property. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members, I realize also that you should really take into consideration about changing the zone. Could you state your name I, and address? Oh, I'm sorry, for the Jean Tiantiola, 624 uh, Post Island Road. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have to get my thoughts in order here. <laughs> but the, the thing of it is that it'll be, and you know, when you change the uh, zoning, you'll have a, a different zone or residential that they really will need, and I really want you to take serious consideration that you're not making this change only for the present day, but also for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, the applicant uh, has another crack at the voting. Again, Jeffrey Gordon, uh, first of all, I never represented myself as a licensed surveyor. Uh, there's fewer of me than there are surveyors around, so I'm more rare. Uh, the um, comments uh, about spot zoning, it's a term of art that is so misapplied throughout the years. There's spot zoning that is perfectly fine, and there's spot zoning that is not perfectly fine. Uh, this is residential, next to residential. It's a different kind of residential, but it's still residential. You could not, it'd be a real stretch to apply it there. If I want to put a, an ice cream parlor in the middle of a heavy industrial park and got a rezoned a little island, that would be the improper spot zoning because that'd be totally contrary to the uses around it. So uh, it's actually a term that is not being used much in the planning the field anymore, it's just misused. Um, just to go back a little bit, uh, I did not say that Devon is a bad neighbor. I said they were a bad neighbor, but now they are a good neighbor, and I want to make sure they stay a good neighbor. And the reason uh, that that was a concern, and I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs from a bipartisan report regarding Montville, and Archie's Trojan Horse is called. It said, campaign against converting the Montville plant to coal in 2006. In 2006, Montville power plant owner NRG Inc. proposed to convert the existing oil and gas-fired Montville plant into a new and much larger gasified coal plant. Clean Water Action, the Sierra Club Southeast Group, Toxic Action Center, and the newly formed grassroots Norwich Area Global Warming Action Group teamed up to oppose the proposal primarily on the grounds that it would increase statewide greenhouse gas pollution from power plants a staggering 50%. Citing potential health and environmental impact from air pollution, the proposed coal fuel power plant, the Toxic Action Center and Clean Water Action awarded this project with an ironic 2006 Dirty Dozen Award. 
From communities along the Thames River to the Long Island Sound, we are a coastal region threatened by global warming and its rising sea levels and increasing storm damage. We need our state to set an example for Washington by reducing our own global warming pollution and rejecting this coal plant. This is a start to David Anderson, chairman of the North Greater Norwich Area Global Warning Action Group. A new coal plant is irresponsible for local health and global climate said Sylvia Brood, community organizer for Toxics Action Center. There is nothing clean about coal. NRG altered its proposal to repower Montville as a modern natural gas plant instead of a coal plant, but this proposal was rejected by the State Department of Public Utility Control. The plant remains oil and gas fired. Now, I am not saying that that is going to happen at Devon, but I'm saying that sets of eyes on things of this nature is what keeps things on the straight and narrow. And it's not a bad thing, it is a good thing. And it's not just for the neighbors adjoining, it benefits the whole eco uh, neighborhood, so to speak. Thank you. Um, My name is uh, Nick Beccarelli. I live at 57 Pond Street. Um, I'm also on the Board of Aldermen in the 2nd District, which I believe this property is uh, part of. And I, in the past, have many of my constituents uh, call and try to fix many of the problems that used to be down there when they were working as cycling uh, property. Um, I, have only but to look across the river and look and see uh, at all the development that's taking place over there. And you you see just beautiful residential houses looking over the water. I do appreciate the concern for these people in the water view because it is a, a very nice thing, very expensive thing sometimes, but uh, it's nice to live near the water and have water views. You know, I suppose if you guys were originally uh, developing the city from the start, that area probably would have been residential because of the water and uh, the um, likeliness that people would want to live there. Um, the Devon uh, power plant, if that's what's been talked about tonight, is um, I always was under the impression that it was very close to closing down that they really have a skeleton crew there now and it only goes online when we're close to having brownouts or blackouts and when they call up and say fire it up. But, you know, I suppose if they are looking to burn gold there, when I was a kid, the entire uh, Stratford Mall, so to speak, as soon as you go over there, there's that whole complex over there, that was just huge piles of coal. They used to bring it in on the barges and there's just, I mean, miles of coal for that molecule. So if you're gonna if you're gonna burn coal, it's probably gonna need a place to put it. Maybe it's next door. But um, I think changing it to residential probably would be uh, a nice thing for the city. Probably would make um, that whole area down there a little bit better as a residential zone because uh, having those trucks up and down that street there it really did aggravate a lot of people. And I just figured I'd put my two cents in, and uh, I know you guys will do the best that you can. And I appreciate this time to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, just to set the record straight on yeah. two points. Go ahead. One is the Devon plan has no plan to burn coal at this site whatsoever. And as far as the second set of eyes, it is highly regulated by state and federal laws, and they comply all the time. They have to do constant reporting, <coughs> constant monitoring, and I don't know what the average pair of eyes is going to do that the state and federal regulations aren't already taken care of. And then the last point is, there are absolutely no plans on behalf of Devon Power or NRG to purchase the recycling property. I can assure you if there's any interest, they probably would not have waited this long. There is no 
Commissioner, all commissioners. I just want to add. I'm sorry, if you're doing an address for the. John Gibbs, John Gibbs uh, of Primrose Companies, uh, the developer. Um, I just wanted to, just because uh, there's been so much talk about you know, uh, zoning, um, you know, I just wanted to remind the commission the reason why I'm here. What you have is you have a you have a property that for 10 years now has been litigation is going on. Uh, the only reason why it hasn't been operational is because of the individuals involved. Nobody's going to come up with an alternative industrial use for this site. The cost to mitigate it and the cost to do anything with the crossing is so prohibitive that there is no industrial use other than the recycled use. Now, keep in mind, the recycled use has never ceased to exist. It's grandfathered in. It just so happens that the individuals involved at this time, because of reasons that you know, I don't need to, to bring up here, were they lost their license. That doesn't mean another <coughs> reputable individual couldn't come along and get a new license. And then you have the recycle operation going, and the adjoining residential uh, neighbors all up in arms because it's going. So I'm here because of the fact that the only way to solve the, the problem that's been going on forever, and granted, yes, I can understand why Devon Power would not like to see, you know, more residential developments going on. I mean, I, I go up Nogatak Avenue and every single backyard of those residents backs up to Devon Power. And it's been there for what? These residents were built 50 years ago, 60 years ago. So I just want you to consider the fact that the reason I'm here <coughs> is the fact it is because of my involvement with Caswell Co. And that the only way to have Caswell's issues, not only for the development of the last phase, but also the issues they've had in the past. I mean, Attorney Alisi is going representing them in the lawsuits pertaining to the use. It's not just, he's not just now on board. He's, he's been part of the litigation that's been going on with the town attorneys and everybody else's attorneys. This has been going on forever. So what I'm suggesting to you is this, and I said this last time. I'm very familiar with industrial areas. I mean, that's, I developed. I've been now for 15 years on Canal Street and Shelton, redeveloping that whole area. I took over the asphalt plant, the Pilcon asphalt plant, plant and the Beard uh, uh, construction sites, and it turned it into Avalon and to other developments. So I know how to develop. But what I'm suggesting to you here is this, that if anybody in this room believes that there's going to be an alternative industrial use for that site, they're dreaming. It's not going to happen. The only thing that's going to happen is that if you deny this application, I back out, that turns into a, a continuing recycling transfer station. That's what's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on the issue? I think the applicant has the last word. Was that the last word from the applicant? Yes, sir. Okay, if so, then uh, <laughs> stay here Without objection, I'll close the public hearing. The public hearing is closed. Um, we have a, uh, a significant issue in that we have been uh, instructed uh, that because of a claim, we need a supermajority to um, to approve this. We do not even have a supermajority here present. So um, I'm going to ask that this be put on the next meeting's agenda, and that we, uh, we have our final discussion and vote on it. We need an extension from the applicant. Oh. I thought that was only for no, the because because we got for the open for, for the public hearing. The public no, but they had 30 for, for action. It's for, yes, there's a clock for the public hearing which just closed, 
and we've got an extension for that. So now they would have to give us an extension because you didn't take action yet. So oh, you close the hearing. What is the date? No, you, no, you close the hearing. You close the hearing. So now the clock starts on the. On the now the clock starts. Okay. So we're good, and we are going to uh, address this at our next meeting when we have enough members here to actually have a potential for it to be accepted. Okay. You know it would be automatically to denied tonight. Do you know the date of the next meeting? It will be the first, uh, the first uh, Tuesday in February. Thank you. First Tuesday February. Okay, so I would, I, I would ask that people who are here for that public hearing that don't want to stay for the rest of it, they kind of sneak out quietly so we can get to meet with our next item. Thank you. space that was supposed to be installed next to the dumpster. Uh, it's supply David with pictures uh, this morning to show that that work was completed. Obviously, with the asphalt plants uh, closed for the winter, the parking space is there. Uh, there's a gravel base to it that needs to have a course of asphalt behind uh, once the plants reopen. But other than that, the uh, items <coughs> that needed to be performed at the site plan were so this application is basically an amendment to the, uh, the special permit and the uh, 
uh, site plan approval to allow for a seasonal uh, tent enclosure over the patio, which was shown on the original site plan. So we did distribute to you an amended site plan showing uh, the area in the back, which is the patio, and including with it an elevation drawing showing the, uh, the tent enclosure. So basically, this is to enclose the patio area during the winter months. Uh, the statement of use that we amended stated that the, uh, the tent would be up during the months of November through April. It's going to uh, not be attached to the roof line of the building. We did have a discussion with Joe Griffith relative to building code uh, requirements that uh, there be some separation between the two roof lines. But it'll be a freestanding uh, structure <coughs> with uh, a hard coarse roof with plastic walls to it. Uh, there'll be an external uh, propane heater that uh, is shown on the site plan. Uh, there'll be a burner that will be part of the tent structure itself. So the propane gas goes to the burner and the burner blows uh, warm air into the building. But basically, as you can see, uh, the intent here is for them to be uh, allowed to continue to use that patio area uh, during the winter months. And uh, there'll be no other change in the operation. There's not going to be any other change in the hours of the operation. Uh, it doesn't increase the fire department's uh, occupancy load for the, uh, <coughs> for the facility. It just allows people to gather outside <coughs> during the winter months. And that's basically it. Uh, any questions? You may have, my clients are here, but uh, that's the sum and substance of the application. David, any comment? Uh, you have my report, there's really nothing I can add. You know, just any questions from the board? Just, um, Mr. Salkis, you're, you're satisfied with the site work that's done so far? Uh, I, I will ultimately need an as built. Okay. And um, if you want to make a condition of approval that Unpaid parking spot be paid, that would be great. Well, it should be. It was supposed to be anyway. Right. Right? Yes. Yeah. That is this, in fact, total parking calculations in any yeah. It's because it's it's the same it's the same space that the board originally approved. I mean, they're really just asking to you know, close it. Use it more frequently. Yeah, more frequently. You know, six months. You know, uh, November to April. Any other questions or comments? Can I just ask for a clarification on the condition? Because the intent is, if this is approved tonight, they'd like to put the tent up. And I understand the condition of having the pavement done for the parking space, but that wouldn't be able to be done until the spring. Right. Uh, that's, that's fine. It's, yeah, you would, there would be no issue with What's you. What's fine? <laughs> you got it. We would just expect that when the asphalt is put on, and provide an asphalt. I think we could do the asphalt now. It's just the paper. Yeah. And I did email uh, uh, Matt today, and that's something that they can get. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I don't see any reason why we can't act on this. Public hearing? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I got so confused here. Okay, so this is a public hearing. So if anyone would like to speak, please come to the podium. Seeing none, public hearing is closed. No longer public hearing. Any, uh, we got a motion? Mr. Chair? Uh, through you to uh, Mr. Lynch. Um, would uh, Mr. Lynch or his uh, client be opposed to uh, posting a small bond uh, to guarantee that the uh, asphalt work be done? And on this is one space. Did you quote? No, it's just one. Okay. Well, the, the, the reason being, we're going to get the report that they're going to put up their tent. Yeah. And we just need to guarantee that at the end, the work is just. Can, can I request a $1,500 bond? That's the cost that they... That's fine. That's okay. That's fine. That was the quote that they got to, uh, uh, to do the work. So if we can get a motion that includes a $1,500 bond, that would be good. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, it, with 100 baton drive, I would make a motion to approve with the following conditions the petition of Thomas B. Lynch uh, for amendment to special permit with site review on map 73, block 928, parcel HQ, of which Best Buddies LLC is the owner. And the conditions would be that there was some um, site work that needed to be done uh, for the original plan. And uh, we would make that a condition of this permit, as well as posting the $1,500 bond to uh, guarantee the work. Right. Would that be acceptable? Yeah. Uh, or an amount by the that sounds perfectly reasonable, but it would be an amount. That kind of work we would typically run by the city engineer. So it just, it's probably fine, but I just want to run that amount just by him to make sure it's fine. We have a motion and a second? I'll second. A second. Any further comments? Yeah, I think that I think the bond is uh, reasonable. It's one space, right? Yes, so it's, it's, it's just one space. It's 100 square feet or we don't even, whatever it is. So. Um, I'd have ask for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Sure. Passes unanimous. Thanks so much. <coughs> All right. All right. All right. Okay, next order of business. Uh, 363 Naugatuck Ave, Zone CDE 2, petition of Thomas Lynch for special permit with site plan review for offices over 5,000 square feet. Map 15, block 241, parcel 1, of which 363 Naugatuck Avenue, LLC is the owner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, for the record, Thomas Lynch. Uh, with this application representing AT&T Services Incorporated, uh, AT&T is the owner of the nationally broadcast The Ann Patrick Show. And uh, we're before you tonight uh, seeking approval for uh, site plan and uh, special permit for 363 North Avenue to allow AT&T to renovate and construct a media production facility at the site. Uh, it'll consist of an uh, office building with uh, sets, a kitchen, and other amenities which we're going to be going into uh, during the course of our presentation. <clears throat> but uh, with me also tonight is Eric Jones from AT&T Real Estate, Eric uh, Zawatsky, who is the project in, uh, engineer who's going to go through the elements of the site plan, and Alan Legoski, who is the project architect. <clears throat> now we handed out to you at the outset a, uh, a bound handout, and uh, uh, Eric is going to go through the graphics in there. But uh, basically, uh, the property is the former United Rental Center, located at 363 Nogata. The property is approximately 1.46 acres. Uh, it's zoned in the CDE2 zone. So uh, this application requires a special permit for an office building that exceeds 5,000 square feet. So uh, I'm going to ask Eric just to go through the basic uh, uh, features of the graphics, and then I'm going to go into a little bit more background and then <clears throat> discuss the site plan after that. So here. Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Jones. I don't know if I can give you my address, but it's uh, 13 Bethel Street in Norwalk. I'm the Associate Director of Creative Operations uh, for AT&T Entertainment. 
Um, just wanted to kind of give you guys a background. Uh, I think most of you know, but Dan's studio is currently here in Milford as well, right above the Subway restaurant in downtown Milford. It's been there for about eight years. It's about 3,500 square feet. Um, we've really outgrown that probably three years ago, and have been kind of looking for some someplace new in town that gave us more square footage, some private parking <coughs> that was not in the downtown area, and um, some outdoor space to do um, some things that are in here. So um, I won't waste your time tonight, but um, if you guys had a chance to look through this, um, there's a couple sets. Um, first three pages um, just show the Dan Patrick, where he'll sit. Um, and then on the other side of a glass wall are where the Danettes sit, which are his on-camera and on-radio personalities that he contributes with. Um, you'll see on um, page five, um, there's about a 5,500 square foot um, area where United Rentals was doing work on some of their equipment. Um, we're going to turn that into like a field house. So you'll see a regulation half-court basketball court. You'll see some turf on the following page. Um, we'll do some football drills, things like that. Um, there is a small kitchen. Um, we did have a health department and sewer looked at it and was not, because it's not for public consumption, didn't require um, a lot of things that normally be required in a commercial kitchen. Um, and then the last <coughs> page here um, just shows the outdoor space um, on the map over here. Um, so that's a, a little busy boat area. We'll have a couple of, um, one of our sponsors is Traeger Grill, which is like a pellet smoker. And we uh, cook once a week to demo that smoker. So we would set that up out there. So, um, But that's kind of just the overall kind of long term, uh, not that long, hoping to build in the next three months, um, be done with the building in three months. But um, that's kind of where we're going with, with the project. So thank you for your time. So as I stated before, the property is one point four six acres. Uh, the site plan itself shows parking on the easterly side of the property. Uh, if you're familiar with the property, you know it's uh, located on the southern side of Nogatuck Avenue, actually next door to the Devon Fire Station. Uh, and under Section 514 of our zoning regulations, uh, we're asking for the approval of the site plan with 18 parking spaces and one handicap space. Section 514 gives you the latitude to uh, recognize the use of the building, and uh, uh, if you go by the uh, bare bones regulations, calculating the square footage for an office uh, building, uh, the parking requirement would be much larger. But the paved area on the uh, westerly side of the property is not going to be used at all. The only parking area is going to be the parking area <coughs> on the right hand side of the uh, easterly side of the. Uh, uh, the building. And there's going to be 12 uh, employees on site. Uh, seven of them will be uh, full-time employees and five will be uh, part-time employees. So those 12 employees plus the occasional guests that will be on site uh, during uh, the course of production where Dan will have uh, uh, guests come onto the uh, site of the building, uh, 18 parking spaces we feel would be uh, perfectly adequate for the, uh, the need. Uh, Dan's current facility uh, is located downtown Milford at uh, uh, the second floor over the Seven Seas restaurant. Uh, as Eric just mentioned, that site has been, uh, the use uh, far exceeds the available square footage there. So this enables uh, Dan to continue to have his production to uh, have the show emanate from here in Milford. And I think it's a, it's a great uh, plus for the city of Milford. Dan and his wife Susan are active members of the community. They've lived here for over 20 years. Uh, and this enables the Dan Patrick Show now to remain in a modern, uh, updated facility, <coughs> providing them with the, uh, you know, the ability to produce the show for a long term. Um, as I said, uh, the property is in the CDD2 zone, the site plan, and I'm going to turn things over to uh, uh, Eric to uh, go through that. But the site plan is zoning compliant, other than the parking count that I just mentioned. All of the <coughs> elements of the zoning regulations are met. The plans have been reviewed by all city departments. The uh, fire department reviewed things. The health department had to review the plans uh, as it relates to the kitchen. The kitchen is not going to be used for producing food that's going to be sold to the public, so they uh, clearly have no 
issue with that. Uh, so I'm going to turn things over to Eric to go through the site plan and then to Alan to go through the floor plan and I'll conclude with some comments. My name is Eric Zawatsky. I work for DTC. We're doing the uh, civil engineering site plan design project. Um, so basically you said uh, we're not going to be using the western side of the, uh, of the property at all. There's a gate that goes across here and it comes up along the line and that, that will remain locked. Um, basically the plan is to be is to, re, is to seal coat this parking lot, put all the cracks in, restripe it, and then we're going to remove here and here there's some tape. We're going to remove it to kind of define this entrance. Uh, we're going to add lighting to the parking lot. Um, there's two uh, poles here and four more lights on the building. Um, there's an existing decorative fence and gate right here. We're going to add a motor to that so when people come in, they can, in a car rear, so they can uh, get in that way, get access that way, and keep it locked. Um, we're going to replace these two aprons and some sidewalk sections that are damaged, and that will decrease possibly depending on the, the town engineers we're dealing with. Place we will do so. Um, we're going to add a bunch of plant, plant things up front. Uh, they work better along the fence line. Let's see. So currently, the drainage all goes out to the brook here. So if you're going to completely clean out all the catch basins and lines of all the debris, sediment, leaves, everything, and then this won't be used, but we will put filters and all the catch basins in here, which will collect any sediment anything like that, but they'll, twice a year or so, they'll have to clean those out. Uh, and that's, uh, we will be adding, this is a barrier, a visual barrier around the gazebo set, that they, those, those uh, photos. And right here, it's going to be a generator. The same thing with a barrier around it. Uh, and that's, that's basically it for the site. There's not a whole lot going on. We're trying to limit our as much as possible. <clears throat> My name is Alan Ladaki. I'm an architect with Williamson Whitaker Architects. I'm just going to go over briefly some of the relationships that you, you saw, the, the renderings that Eric Jones mentioned to you, and I'll just go over the, the footprint of the building, the Nog Attack Avenues at the bottom of the sheet. The Dan Patrick Studios here, the Danette Studios here. There's a series of windows that are going to stay in place. We're going to be uh, putting reflective uh, film on them just because uh, to, to create a sound wall on the inside to be able to uh, control the noise in, in the studio so that we don't get street noise and traffic noise, from the, et cetera. So we're, but we're going to maintain the look of the existing building. The main entrance is going to be adjacent to this outdoor set where the parking is. And in here, that's where the handicap access spot is. Um, the field house set, this is the back part of the building. There's another portion of the building that we're not using at all that's just going to be for storage of sets for the different um, events that take place within the, the studio. Here's the kitchen set. The Danette set, there's a golf simulator, the outdoor gazebo and outdoor set. There's going to be some, uh, the green room for guests. And there's going to be some office areas having to do with the production of the show. Um, call screening room, mail room, voiceover booths, uh, edit, edit, edit offices, audio offices, the server farm, and then offices for the production staff. There's also going to be an R, this RV set. The show has, Dan has a, an RV that is part of the show. So there'll be guests will be filmed coming out of the RV and onto the set. And, and as Eric mentioned, we're not do, doing anything. To, we're going to repaint the, the facade, um, clean it up, and we're going to uh, demo this existing roof and create the new roof over the, over the new entrance to the facility. That concludes our presentation today. As I said, Dan's been uh, producing his show and, and uh, broadcast from the River Street location since 2007.
and uh, got grown that space. This is going to be an exciting venture for Milford because it is a major uh, sports uh, broadcast. It's uh, broadcast radio and TV shows broadcast on a daily basis through the ATT Sports Network and Direct TV. And this is just a wonderful thing to have here in Milford. Um, they've already started to do fit up in the building, and they're under uh, time constraints with the uh, lease that they signed to try to get this uh, opened up by April. So if the board is inclined to act on this tonight, that would be fantastic uh, so that they can get moving forward with it. Thanks so much. David, any comment? Oh, you got my report. Uh, a nice low impact reuse of my existing building. Any other any questions or comments from the board? Uh, I have a question. The uh, left side uh, paved area, mm -hmm. is that suitable for any kind of overflow parking that might be needed at any time based on, uh, you know, if they have a special event or something? We were told by the city there is room for that. There's, there's room for it, but to be honest with you, in his review of the plans, Greg Bedlusky, our city engineer, uh, said that if that area is going to be utilized, there's certain drainage uh, uh, upgrades that he would require. And to be honest with you, to the tune of 150 to $200,000, and it's just not cost effective relative to the lease arrangement that's here. So the short answer to your question is no. And we don't anticipate that um, uh, the parking need on site will exceed what we're providing on the site. Plan. Any other questions or comments from the board? Hi, uh, there's a public hearing. So, anyone would like to come up and speak? Please do so now. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, I would entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve uh, 363 Nongatuck Avenue, petition of Thomas Lynch uh, for special permit and site plan review of office over 5,000 square feet on Map 15, Block 241, Parcel 1, in which 363 Nongatuck Avenue LLC is the owner. We have a motion, we have a second. Mr. Grant, um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Seeing none, that's unanimous. Passes. Thanks so much. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item of business is the ASON reports. Seeing none, we'll go to the regulation subcommittee. Mr. Grant, would you like to walk us through this? Uh, yeah, we have uh, kind of, uh, four uh, uh, proposal changes to the zoning regulations that the uh, subcommittee is proposing uh, for the board to uh, pass, uh, to recommend to pass on for the uh, city and uh, uh, other agencies' uh, recommendations. Okay. So again, I always like to point this out. We're not voting on um, approving um, any of these regulations. All we're doing is the okay to be sent to the regional council of governments and deep and whatever the other stakeholders for their um, input, if any. And that will be to us where we actually can dive into the language and, and you know, give it some deliberation. So that's why I would um, entertain a motion. Um, Second. I had moved to approve uh, the recommendation of the Regulation Subcommittee to circulate items one through four as listed on the agenda under section G, which would be uh, amendment numbers, uh, tracking numbers, number 41-18, 42-18, 43-18, Forty-three dash eighteen and forty-four dash eighteen. We have a motion. We have a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? That's unanimous. Next item of business is approval of minutes. We have a motion. We have a motion. We have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. I'll say. One of those here. 
one abstention. Bill passes. The next item of business is chair's report. I have none tonight. Next item of business is staff report. But just very briefly, uh, I got in the mail and I forgot to copy it to, to send to you, but I will do that. Uh, in uh, March, March 23rd, uh, which is a Saturday, there's the, uh, the state the bar land use training, uh, which comes up, I believe, every other year. Uh, it's a full day, uh, very, uh, uh, I won't will say intense, very informative. It's very informative. And uh, March 23rd. Pretty sure that's during March Madness, though, so. Yeah, that's the one it was. So, do you have an e copy of that? I'll, I will I will get you a copy of it. And you'll get it to everyone. I will get it to everyone. So, we pay and you reimburse and we you? We reimburse you, yes. Okay. We, we learned our lesson, yes. We used to pay ahead of time and then no one went. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, and I did attend on um, this. And it was at Wesleyan as well, and, and I did learn a lot. So yeah. I would advocate that if you have time that day, we get a group together and caravan up. But it was very good. Um, next item of business is, is adjournment. We have a motion. A motion. All right, we're done.